All right, I'm gonna give everybody a minute to all get logged in and then we will get started. But I am very, very, very excited about this webinar today. Um, as you guys know, my name is Ginger. I am the executive director of the Connectionology Seminars of America, and we are so excited to have you. Um, but I am either more looking forward to today's webinar because we are featuring Brian Chase out of Newport Beach, California. Um, and he's going to be sharing with you guys a lot of great information about auto defect cases. He's an expert on this. Um, now, I do know that you're going to have questions, so I want you to be sure to put those in the Q&A box for me. I'm going to be helping handle those. We're going to take most of the questions at the end of the webinar, but if you have a really great question on one of the topics that he'll be covering, just put it in the Q&A box, and I will try to get to it as soon as we can. And then later on, you're going to meet four of our incredible partners with HMR, Fox AE, and OnPoint. You hear me rave about these companies. They are tremendous and they are wonderful people. And um, you're going to get a chance to meet them later on. And then, of course, we'll be doing our coffee giveaway at the very end. Um, we'll be bringing in, hopefully, Ted will be with us today with HMR. And one of you is going to be a lucky winner. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. I want to introduce our amazing speaker today, Brian Chase. Um, and as you guys know, he is in a nine attorney AB rated national law firm founded in 1977 in Newport Beach, California. And he's also the managing partner as well as a senior trial attorney that heads up the litigation department of the firm. And in the firm, it actually specializes in auto defect cases, as you guys know, which is his passion, and then catastrophic personal injury cases, mass torts like pharmaceutical and medical devices, um, where he has held a lot of leadership roles. Um, and they also handle a lot of unemployment, employment, and consumer class actions. Um, in addition to that, he was in 2015, the president of the Consumer Attorneys of California, which is incredible, as well as in 2007, the president of the Orange County Trial Lawyers Association, which are two amazing organizations here in California. Um, he's also a member of ABOTA and um, in 2014 and 2004, he was named the Trial Lawyer of the Year in Products Liability by the Orange County Trial Lawyers Association. And then in addition to that, in 2012, he was actually named the Trial Lawyer of the Year by um, the Consumer Attorneys Association of California, as well as the Trial Lawyer of the Year nominee by the Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles. And um, so he's received multiple awards, you guys, and he speaks all around the country. Um, in 2020 and 2021, he was also listed in the Daily Journal Top Plaintiff Lawyers, and he's also been listed as one of the top 100 trial lawyers by the American Trial Lawyers Association, and that's been since 2007. And then he's also been listed as the nation's top 1% by the National Association of Distinguished Counsel. And in addition to that, guys, he's written two incredible books. Um, one of them, which was in 2009, it's called Still Unsafe at Any Speed, and I'm going to have him talk about that during this webinar, um, because he just went ahead and published a um, kind of like a fresh version of this book um, back in 2019, and that one's called The Second Collision. So these are two books you definitely want to look into, and I believe Brian said he'd be happy to send you a copy if you're interested. Um, I put his email in the chat box for you. And then in addition to that, if you want to copy of today's slides, you'll also be able to reach out to him directly. Um, and besides all of these incredible awards that he's received, he's also a frequent um, guest speaker on several radio and television stations. So you may have seen him on CBS Morning Show, Good Morning America, the CBS Special Reports, CNN, World News Tonight, and Fox 11 News, which is incredible. And he is also the lead attorney on four very important um, precedent setting appellate opinions. Um, I'm gonna actually email these to you guys because I think they're really cool, but <clears throat> Martinez versus Mason and Ford Motor Company is one of them. Um, but I'm gonna email this to you because I think it'd be worth looking into. So Brian, we are just so honored to have you. It is gonna be a great webinar and I'm really looking forward to hearing everything you're gonna teach us today. Well, wow, Ginger, thank you for uh, for th for that lead and that introduction. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm turning red over here and kind of embarrassed. I owe you for that. That was that was that was pretty nice. So thank you very much, um, and thank you everybody who is is watching this today. I love. Let me share my screen and get my PowerPoint up for everybody. Um, and okay, 
There we go. So there's That's my contact perfect. information. Um, <clears throat> it's got my cell phone and my email address for anybody if they are interested in getting a copy of this presentation. Happy to share it with you. Uh, Ginger mentioned the two books I've written uh, on auto defects. And, and it really what I'm talking about today is in those books. The first book is deals with how to identify them. I want to make sure that you're real clear on that when I finish today. And the second book is, is more of some litigation or some trial st strategies and, and, an, and an update on the book on identifying it. So if anybody would like copies of those, again, text me, call me, email me. I'd be more than happy to give you a free copy of either of the books too. Um, as you'll hopefully see today, this is a real passion of mine. I have been doing almost exclusively in my personal practice at the firm auto defect cases for about 25 years um, all over the country. <clears throat> I have a big passion for it. Um, I love teaching it. And, and in large part, I love teaching it because I've been doing it so long. I think I have some good nuggets to share with you and hopefully you'll get some today. But also I have had so many clients come to me over the years, literally where they went to another law firm or a couple law firms and told they didn't have a case or they, you know, they got the $15,000 policy or the $100,000 policy and told they didn't have any, you know, of an additional case. And even some very well-meaning attorneys had hired experts and the experts said they didn't have an auto defect case or some other remedy. And that has happened dozens of times over my career. And on all those quote unquote, no cases I've resolved or got verdicts, you know, for millions of dollars for those people. So we owe it to our clients or our prospective clients not to miss these cases. A lot of people really do, even, even well-intentioned people that know to look for an auto defect case will miss them. I want to make sure I'm going to give you some great tips today. I've got pictures, I've got videos to show you how I identify these cases, really uh, photographs and a police report. Oftentimes, I don't even need to hire experts. I want to share those, those secrets with you and tips with you. Because um, I don't want you to miss the cases. You owe it to your clients. You owe it to your practice and your business um, not to miss these cases, too. So um, without further ado, I'm going to move on here. So the, the defects that I'm going to cover today um, are what I call, I sort of, I call them the cookie cutter defects. These are the defects that we see every day on the road. Um, there are obviously one-off cases, and I'll talk about that or touch on that later, that I, you know, I can't cover 100 different defects. But the defects that literally happen every day on our nation's highways and that are going to come across your intake team, I'm going to go through today. So I'm going to talk about seatback failure cases, and I'll give you pictures and videos, and, and so you'll understand exactly what I mean by that. I'm going to talk about rollovers, rollover cases. I'm going to talk about roof crush cases where roofs crush in and catastrophically injure or kill people. Uh, I'm going to talk about tire cases, tread separation cases. I'm going to talk about airbag cases, both failing to deploy, inadvertently deploying when they shouldn't. Sometimes they deploy aggressively and cause injuries. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about seatbelt buckle failure cases. And, and I'll give you some really good tips and pictures on how, I, how to identify these cases. In the old days, I'd have to give an expert a few thousand bucks, go look at a car. Now, I know what to look for. Nine times out of 10, there's always going to be a case you're definitely going to need an expert early on. But I'm going to show you some good pictures on that, <clears throat> on how to ID those. I'm going to talk about door latch failure cases. I'm going to talk about fire cases. And then kind of a new trend that I see a, a lot more of these cases is lack of including safety options. Cars have gotten safer, um, but manufacturers, if the government doesn't make them, you know, put a safety item in there, you know, we don't have them. We'd have to pay for seatbelts if the government didn't make them. So these, these safety option cases, I'm going to give you a lot of examples of those because I see a lot of those cases out there. Um, as well. So, and as Ginger said, I know we're going to have, I think, 30 minutes of Q&A set aside at the end, but if I finish, you know, one of these defect categories, and if you have a, a question, put it in the chat box, and then Ginger, while it's fresh in your mind, and then she can decide um, if, if, if we want to interrupt and answer some of those questions now versus waiting until the end. I'll leave that up to, to you guys and Ginger. Okay, so <clears throat> first thing on deciding whether to accept the case, Common pitfalls that I see is one, if no significant damages. Um, you know, they're expensive cases to litigate. And so you need to have a catastrophic injury. You know, typically, you know, a bro broken arm or a broken leg is, is not going to cut it. You really need a, you know, catastrophic TBI, spinal cord injury. Um, you need the damages there with a, with a big life care plan, preferably to get the manufacturers to want to, 
you know, try to resolve the cases with you short of trial. Um, I get people referring me cases all the time and, it, and, it's, and it's a good defect case, but the damages just aren't there. You've got 50 grand in meds or something like that. So you really, in general, want a catastrophic injury. Um, another thing that I really like to talk about this is the general rule of thumb. If the vehicle's not preserved, you don't have a case. Now, I do some cases without a car. It's rare, but I do. And so normally when I talk to people that do auto defect cases, this is the part they cringe on because most lawyers will tell you no car, no case, period, black, black and white rule. Um, when I get to the seatback cases, I have done several of those cases, you know, survived MSJ, started trial on them um, and resolved those cases for, you know, seven and eight figures with no vehicle. Um, and I'll explain sort of how we do that. But basically, there are certain defects that as long as you have really good pictures um, and you have a signature injury, you don't need the car. Again, it's the exception to the rule in general, no car, no case, but I would hate for someone to have a case where you can do it without the vehicle and you tell the, the, the client, you know, they don't have a case. I get a lot of those as well. The third point I want to talk about is failing to retain the right auto product liability experts. Um, as I stated in the beginning, I've had people come to me where a law firm hired an engineer uh, you know, somebody that they use in their ordinary everyday PI cases, go look at the car and just say there's no defect. But, you know, if you don't specialize in auto defect cases, those experts can miss the cases too. So one is hopefully when I get done today, I'm going to show you how to identify many of these defects without even having an expert early on look at it. But either way, if, if it's a case where you do need an expert, you want to get somebody that specializes and auto products liability cases, not somebody that just happens to be an engineer because they can miss the case. And I see that happen a lot. And if anybody has any questions at, at the end of this, feel free to email me or text me on my cell phone uh, on various experts uh, and various uh, fields of expertise they have. Be happy to point you in the right direction. So you've got people that know exactly what to look for. The other problem is you get an expert that doesn't necessarily do auto defect cases, but early on they tell you you have a good case. And after you're into it for fifty or hundred thousand dollars, and you're getting ready to designate them, they start then telling you, "Well, you know, you don't really have a case. Now you're in a bind." So you really want to get the right experts on these cases. It really is a niche um, uh, specialty for folks. Okay, so the first defect I'm going to talk about is seatback cases. And um, so when I talk about a seatback case, what do I mean? I'm going to show you. Here's a crash test, it's a sled test I did, and we're pulling the car backwards. It's to replicate a rear end accident. So when I run this video, you'll see the driver's seat laid down flat, collapse rearward. You'll see the dummy hit its head in the back seat. And so when I'm talking about a seat back case, this is what I'm talking about. So car gets rear ended, 35, 40, 45, whatever miles per hour. You know, almost every car on the road will do that if they get rear-ended at, you know, 40 plus miles per hour. Your seat will lay down flat. Um, so when I say seat back case, that's what I'm talking about. Rear-end accident, seat collapse rearward, and somebody gets hurt. There's two mechanisms of injury that we typically want to look for in these cases. One is injury to the person in the front seat. Obviously, if uh, the seat lays down, or maybe not obviously, but when the when the driver goes back there, or it could be the passenger, they hit their head back there. What typically happens is you break your neck and you're usually your quadriplegic or a paraplegic from these types of accidents. And so we're looking for someone in a front seat that got injured by their seat breaking and then going into the back seat, oftentimes get a TBI as well. Then the other um, plaintiff or, or, or person that we're looking for in these cases is someone that's injured that was sitting in the rear seat. I mean, the auto industry tells us, right, where do you put your children? You're supposed to put them behind, you know, mom or dad in the rear seat. And obviously, I just ran that. This happens too. So if there's a child back there, I get a lot of cases, and these are really devastating cases, is where one of the parents, they get rear-ended. <clears throat> Let's try to run that again for you. They get rear-ended, and the parent goes back and strikes the child. And I've had children get hit in the chest and rupture their aorta and kill them. More often than not, it's just gonna be catastrophic brain injury or facial fractures. 
So that's what you're looking for typically. When I say seat back case, you wanna see if somebody in one of the front seats got injured. Um, and if you've got a child back door, or it can be an adult as well, uh, in the rear seat, you're gonna to wanna to look to see if, if they got injured. Now, what do you look for at intake? So what I have here on the left-hand side, you can see this car, uh, the seat's laid down. Hopefully you can see the arrow there, the driver's seat on this Honda. It's laid down flat. So if someone calls me up, and they might not say, I have people think, hey, hey, Mr. Chase, I, I have an airbag case for you. Well, it's not an airbag case and the airbag shouldn't have gone off. It's really, it's a seat back case. People don't know necessarily to look, look for that. But on intake, if I've got a driver or a, a front seated occupant that's got a brain injury or a broken neck and they're paralyzed and they were in a rear end accident, I'm thinking seat back case. I want to get pictures. If I see the seat laid down like that, I already know that I've got a seat back case. I don't need to pay an expert a few grand or five grand or 10 grand to let me know that. I know I've got a seat back case from that. Now, what can happen is first responders, tow truck driver, after the accident, when they move the car, sometimes they put the seat up. So just because the seat's not laid down like that does not mean you don't have a seat back case. So I wanna be real clear on that. If you see the seat laid down like that, and someone's got a broken neck and they're paralyzed or a child in the rear rear was injured and you see a seat like that, you know you have a case. Now, if a first responder moved the seat up and it happens all the time, the, the other area I look for is this picture on the right-hand side. You can see the uh, that rear end damage. This was an Audi case we had. Um, I think they got hit at like 40 miles an hour, 44 miles an hour. So if I see a car that's got rear damage like this or worse, and I've got a front seat passenger that broke their neck and they're paralyzed, they have a TBI, or there's a child in the rear that's got facial fractures and a brain injury. When I see this kind of property damage, I know the seat laid down and, and, that, and I've got a seat back case just with that PD, uh, a picture just like that. So if you have a signature injury, broken neck, spinal cord injury, TBI, or a child getting injured, if you see the seat laid down like this or you see damage like that, I'm gonna go ahead and file that lawsuit. I don't need an expert to come out and I don't need to delay. That's enough for me to know I've got a, I've got a good seat back case. You know, through discovery, you might find out if it's great or just so-so, but I know right there, that's a very viable case. And again, saving the client money up front. You don't need to, to waste money on the experts. Okay, so that's really it on seat backs. So uh, just to kind of come full circle on it, You've got a front seated occupant, broken neck, spinal cord injury, they can get killed, a uh, wrongful death case, or a TBI, or a child in the rear seat that's got injured by someone in the front hitting them. If you see a seat laid down like that or property damage like that on the rear of the car, you know you have a case. So next defect I'm gonna cover is um, rollovers. Those are obviously a little easier to understand. It's like, you know, what is a rollover case? It's, it's simple. Does the car look like it rolled over? So at intake, you know, if I get pictures like this and I see the roof crush, and we're going to talk about roof crush as well, but I know that car rolled over. So I'm initially thinking, okay, I have a potential rollover case. Just because a car rolled over doesn't mean you have a rollover case, but now I'm, I'm going to investigate it further. And if I can do it without, without spending money on experts. Um, early on, obviously you're gonna need them later. So what do I look for? One, I get pictures, car rolled over, someone's got a catastrophic injury, I wanna investigate it further. Now at intake, what do I look for? So what I have here is, this is an example of an on-road rollover. So I'm gonna talk about on-road rollovers and off-road rollovers. Um, so when I say on-road rollover, you can see this diagram here, here's a car, it's on the freeway, it's getting sideways. As it goes here, it starts to roll over and it rolls over on the pavement. Cars can be designed, SUVs too, uh, they should not roll over on flat dry pavement just because someone turns a steering wheel to avoid an animal, to avoid a, a car cutting them off. You should be able to turn your, your big SUV or your van just like a Ferrari and it should spin out. I'm gonna show you a test in a minute to prove that. Um, but especially in the older days, the brand new cars, the 2022s have electronic stability control. It's gone a long way to mitigate against this. Um, it, it, and, and SUVs are different now. They are lower and wider than they were 10, 15 years ago. But there are still millions of these cars on the road 
um, that are 10 years old that roll over at literally as low as 30 miles an hour. So at intake, I see a car is in a rollover. I know that's something that I want, now want to investigate. The thing I'm going to look for is did it roll over on the road? I want to get you know police photos if I see gouge marks in the middle of the freeway or mar you know or tire marks, friction marks in the roadway to where I know it rolled over on the roadway. I know I've got a good rollover case. That should not happen. Period. Now, <clears throat> the opposite. If a car rolls over off-road. So here, what I've identified is these tire marks with these two arrows down here, you can see where they furrowed into this really soft shoulder. So if a car, and then the car's up here. So if a car gets out here in this really soft stuff, I mean, you could roll over, again, a Ferrari or you know an Indy car will roll over, gets out there in that soft stuff. As the car's going sideways, it's just digging in to that dirt, and then it ultimately trips it like a curb. So if I see... Marks like that on the side of the road, these are things I want to look for with the police photos. I know that that car rolled off the road. I know I probably, you know, 90 plus percent don't have a rollover case. Um, now, the roof may have crushed, may have a roof crush case. Seatbelt could have failed. There's other defects, but just limiting it to rollovers. When I see it on the road like that, I know I've got a rollover case. When I see furrow marks like this out and, and, and the car rolled off the road, I probably don't have a rollover case. Now, here's the exception to the rule, and this is where you do have to have an expert help you figure that figure it out. Here's an example. Um, you can see that here's a car that rolled off the road. You see it's got the marks out here in this dirt shoulder, and it rolled off the road. So based on what I just said a minute ago, you might be thinking, okay, you know, it rolled off the road. I don't have a rollover case. Well, there's that middle ground, and this is where an expert needs to help figure it out for, for all of us is this car, even though it did roll off the road, by the time it was right there where that red arrow is, this vehicle was committed to rolling over. And what I mean by that is, car's driving right here, the driver is inattentive, they're starting to drift, okay? And it's drifting right here, now it's drifting over into this lane. Well, by the time the car was here, this person kind of snapped out of it and cranked their steering wheel to the right to get back into their lane. And when they did that, and I'm going to show you some testing in a minute, then this will maybe make a little bit more sense. But when that car, at that point in time, the driver wakes up, realizes, hey, I've got to get back in my lane, turns the steering wheel, that car was going to roll over at that point on. It was committed to rolling over right here, even though it ultimately didn't roll over until it got out here. So here the driver turns the steering wheel to the right. The car now is finally, you know, when it gets here, wants to respond. It gets into a yaw and it rolls over off the road. So, you know, clear on-road rollover, good case, clear off-road rollover, not a good case typically, but you do get this hybrid situation where it rolled off-road, but the car is committed to rolling over before it got there. And I think I've got a good example for you right here. Let me, uh... so I'm gonna run this test. This is a Toyota 4Runner at 32 miles an hour. And then I'll, I'll run it a couple times. So if that SUV did not have those outriggers on it or the training wheels, it would have just rolled over. So what this test is called is it's called an emergency evasive maneuver or a two steer maneuver. And I'm, I'm going to run it again. Um, you'll see the driver and I'll freeze it. He's driving and then he turns the steering wheel to the left. And that's to, that's to replicate if you're getting cut off, an animal darting in front of you, a child darting in front of you, whatever, some emergency coming into your lane. This is a car turning to the left to avoid that. And then you can't keep going that way. So then as soon as you've avoided the, the, the emergency, turns the car back to the right, two steers, and then it rolls over. And again, a car should not roll over just from steer inputs alone. And I'll, let me freeze frame this. Okay, so you see right there, the driver is turning to the left to avoid whatever the obstacle is in front of him, a child, an animal, another car. Uh, so it's gonna turn to the left to get out of the way or avoid the obstacle. And, and now he's turning the car back um, to the right-hand side to get back into his lane. And if you look, hopefully you can see this. I'm gonna, if you can see, so the car is basically going straight. Here's that, the parking lot's going this way. The car is still going in a straight line 
It was driving. It turned over here to the left. Then he's turning back right. The car, even though the car is going straight, look at the rear tires, that right front tire right there. You can see it's already off the ground. This car is going to roll over, even though it's going straight. This is a great example of a vehicle committed to rolling over, even though it's not sideways yet. It just had that second steer, steer input, and boom, it's rolling over. Then if you look at the right rear tire, it's coming off the ground too. So 32 miles an hour, and this thing is committed to rolling over at that point in time. And then when it gets sideways, it totally tips up. And again, if we didn't have the, the training wheels on it, for lack of a better word, um, it would have completely rolled over on its roof. Now, here's the same car, same SUV. It's lowered one inch. It's only an inch lower. You know, they brainwash us with the, the warnings on the visor. Hey, it's an SUV. It's big. It's top heavy. It's going to roll over. And, and then they like to say it trial that people like SUVs because they like to be able to store all their stuff in it. Well, here's the same car. So you can store everything in it you want. It's one inch lower and it's a few inches wider. And this is at 70 miles an hour, same two steers, and it spins out like a sports car. And that's what a properly designed car should do. You should be able to go that fast, be on the freeway, do your evasive maneuver to avoid whatever accident's coming at you and spin out like that and walk away. Um, let me just go through it again real quick just to freeze frame it for you. So there's the driver turning to the left, again, avoiding whatever obstacle, child, animal, getting cut off on the freeway. Now, there's the driver turning the car to the right. And now, if you notice, unlike the one that was on the left, when it was going straight, it was already lifting tires off the ground. This one is beyond straight. It's getting more to the sideways position here. All the tires are on the ground because it's just a few inches wider and one inch lower. It doesn't take much to properly design a car not to roll over. So... Again, going back to then, you know, what do I look for on intake on a rollover case? Does the car look like it suffered rollover damage? If yes, then I want to investigate with scene photos. Did it roll over on the road? If it did, I'm probably going to file that lawsuit even before I get e experts involved because I know cars should not roll over um, on flat, dry pavement with just steer inputs alone. And if it rolled off road, I may go to plan B and look for another defect theory if I can figure one out. Or if I have a hunch the car was committed to rolling over before it left, I then will get my accident reconstruction expert involved, let him reconstruct it a little bit to confirm that the car was committed to rolling over, even though ultimately it rolled over off the road. So that's what I look for to take on those. So now I'm going to move into uh, roof crush. Now, typically, if you have a rollover case, you're also going to have a roof crush case. Um, a lot of these defects go hand in hand because roofs are very weak um, on most of our cars. So when I talk about roof crush, what do I mean? Simple. Here you see the car got rolled over. You see the roof caved in on one side and roofs cave in in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you some various pictures. But when I see a roof do this, that does not, to that does not have to happen. Just like um, cars don't have to roll over. For 40 bucks, you can make a roof not do that. And I'm gonna show you some really neat testing videos I've done um, to prove that to you. But, so <clears throat> just a little bit of, of education here on, on roofs. You know, roofs aren't like a nice big solid roll cage. If they were, they wouldn't crush, but they're a hodgepodge of, of parts. You've got right here, this blue, that's an A-pillar, okay? Um, then you've got a front header there in green. You've got the B-pillar in light blue. Back here, C pillar and pink. And the way pillars are, are, are lettered is the front one is A, B, C. If it's a van, it can be a D pillar in the back. Then you've got front headers like there in green. You've got side headers like there in orange. This red area here, you have a corner junction. So I like to analogize. It's like having a bunch of toothpicks that you glue together. And if you roll over and you land on the roof, these are all just potential areas to fail. And I'm going to show you some photographs, and that's what I look for on intake, is a catastrophic failure of the pillars, the headers, or corner junctions. You'll see, you'll, you'll get one or more of those failure modes in these roof crush cases. So let me give you a couple of examples. 
So here's that photo I had a moment ago, and this is called matchboxing. The roof just kind of matchboxes sideways. Well, you'll see there's where the top of the roof is, where that corner junction was. See that little red dot right there? That's where they put a cap on it to have all these things come together, meet and weld together. So that failed. There's the corner junction there failed. So you got a corner junction failure. This is the A-pillar laid down. It broke down here at the base. So you've got an A-pillar failure down there at the bottom. And then this right here is going sideways is the B-pillar. So this, this, this B-pillar I'm showing you right here that's going straight up, you can see on this roof, it laid down flat and it bent right there at the bottom. That's a common thing that happens. A lot of manufacturers to pass the government testing will have a reinforcement down there low so the roof does good in a test, but it doesn't do good in the real world because the chain is as strong as its weakest link. A lot of times you're going to see a B pillar fail where that reinforcement ends. So that's one example of failure modes. Here's the same thing. Base of the A pillar failed. Now that this is the front header and it's called tenting. Do you have a question, Ginger? Yeah, we did have a question come in, but I was going to let you finish this point. Oh, okay. um, this is really good. And then okay. I'll bring in a couple of our sponsors in a minute. Okay, great. Um, so here again, the A pillar we see failed. This is that front header. And what happens is in, in these roofs, there's a lot of holes drilled in them because they've got wires going through for electrical purposes. Well, again, if you've got a cutout in this piece of metal, that's where it's going to fail in a rollover. Again, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So this is called tenting where it just kind of pops up in the middle because there was a hole um, in that header. Um, here's a couple roofs. Again, you can see there's the A pillar and that corner junction right there. Again, a typical failure mode, tenting on that front header because holes are drilled into that. The base of this A pillar is behind the door there, down there. That failed. This roof here, that's a corner junction. That's the A pillar that should go up like this. It's way back there. Corner junction failure, base of the A pillar failed. Just you get all these different parts put together. They're different gauges of metal. Uh, they're put together with, you know, with um, reinforcements that'll fail, you know, above the reinforcement, um, or they've got hole cutouts in it for wiring to go through and you get in a rollover, you know, common to have, have one or more of those things fail. So going back to the rollovers a minute ago, you may not have a good rollover case because the car rolled off road, but if you have a roof that looks like this, then you still have a case, but it's going to be a roof crush case. And then I'll run the video test and then I'll let you jump in, uh, Ginger, okay? So what we did here, folks, on the left-hand side, it's a drop test. I got a, a Ford Expedition. We hung it upside down, uh, 12 inches off the ground. It's just one foot off the ground. We put it at an angle and we drop it and you'll see what happens. The roof just crushes just like really what we see in, uh, in those pictures I just showed you. One foot off the ground right here and just flattens like a pancake. Um, now on the right-hand side, I'm gonna show you the modified roof. And you know, you ask yourself, which one do you want, want to be in or your family in? It, bound, it doesn't even break the glass. Now on the assembly line, that's 40 bucks. You can have a roof do what this car is doing on the right side of your screen for $40. The test obviously costs more than that, but it's an easy fix really irritates jurors when they see that, well, it's a big SUV. I mean, I guess the roof's gonna crush. No, cars don't have to roll over. Roofs don't have to crush. Seats don't have to fail. Everything I've gone through right now, totally preventable. Um, okay, so Ginger, I think that's it till I go to the next section. Uh, so. I'm mind blown that, that only $40 can save so many lives just by having that fixed, Brian. Wow. Yeah, no, it, it, it's common. And, you know, you run these things in an opening statement, the jurors just, you hear a gasp, you know, they're like, because mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty shocking stuff. Oh, absolutely. This has been interesting. Um, if it's okay, what I'm going to do is close out of your presentation mm. just for a second, because um, I am bringing in Kim with On Point Legal Nurse Consulting. Um, love working with this company, you guys. You want to save Kim's information. She's going to put it in the chat box after she speaks, but um, she's going to go through all the different things that they cover over there. Uh, but you've always heard myself and John Romano, we rave about them. I know the Romano Law Group uses you guys a lot in a lot of cases, Kim, but it is such a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, please share with us a little bit more about what you guys specialize in. 
Great. Thanks, Ginger. This is fascinating. I can't wait to tell my husband, okay, we need to check this. Um, but to tell you a little bit about us, um, we're a legal nurse consulting and a full litigation support firm. Uh, we've been helping attorneys for about 30 years on any cases that involve illness and injury. So we have several key areas that we can help you with. And the first is record organization. So we know how difficult it is to find the information you need in the volumes of records, particularly in cases like these with these accident cases. You mentioned TBI cases. We know how complex they are and how many records there can be. So we have a team of nurses that will organize them for you. They will index them and return them to you in an OCR format. If you're getting bogged down in some of these complex cases, maybe your paralegals could use some help. Um, we, the nurses in our consulting program have a lot of experience helping attorneys. They make the complex information simple. They do this with timelines, chronologies, and it includes our unique case analysis, which outlines strengths and weaknesses, as well as identifies um, missing records, system failures, red flags, and possible defense strategies. We can also identify the impact of pre-existing conditions, which can be um, important for accident and injury cases. And we can um, differentiate between new versus aggravated injuries. Um, we also have a nursing home program that can assist with anything long-term care related from specialized experts who are familiar with those um, standards of care and to do simple merit screens, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, we also have an expert witness program that we provide fresh well-rounded experts in any specialty needed. They're all clinically active and no located nationwide. For damages, we excel at quantifying damages with our life care plans and medical cost projections. And we have both nurse and physician life care planners um, and medical cost projections can be used when um, it's a less complex case, it's a lower cost option. For non-economic damages, uh, our pain and suffering analysis, we learned how important it is to tell the story of the client's symptoms, and they do just that. Um, we quantify what the client is experiencing, loss of freedom, loss of mobility. We pull that information out of the records for you to expand upon. So our goals really are to help you simplify the medicine, make you sure you're not blindsided, and to avoid any surprises. You can email me directly, or you can also submit information through our website on the Contact Us tab. Thanks, Ginger. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kim, for being with us today. And again, if you don't mind, put your information in the chat box because I want everybody to write this down. <laughs> no, save it, you know, whether or not you need to talk to Kim now or later on. Um, but we appreciate all the great work that you do, Kim. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I hope to see you back again very soon. And now you guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to Cody, um, who you probably already know now because you've been seeing him on our webinars a lot lately. And he just finished um, two very good webinars, one of them, which was the carbon monoxide webinar that we did last week. And I promise you, if it's the last thing I do today, that webinar is going to be on our YouTube channel this afternoon. <laughs> so if you didn't see it, you'll have a chance to go and watch it. Um, but Cody does a lot of great work. He's going to share with you what they do. And I hope he's got some videos to show us. Um, and Brian, I think you're going to be interested to see what Cody has to do as well, because, I mean, he blows me away every webinar. So, Cody, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the CO one, so I'm going to have to watch that because I have an interest in that. So, have at it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, everybody, um, we do science and engineering graphics. So, I'm an engineer by trade. I've uh, been trained in accident recon at Northwestern, but we just love... We love communicating uh, complex issues, right? Complex jargon in very simple terms. And uh, and so, Brian, one of the things that I notice is you've got video, right? There's the right design and the wrong design and then what that does. We take that, that same idea and it, it's such a great thing because people say, oh, well, that's how it should be. This is how it should not be. And we make animations. We can show the inner workings of things. 
uh, I've been trained in DD um, diagnostic trouble codes and and all this recall stuff. Uh, so very familiar with with these kinds of things and and uh, uh, product defects. But I want to share uh, just a quick case with you. Um, this was a product def defect case. It was it was improperly designed, but it was actually the median cables. And a guy was driving a, a Dodge Viper. And so I'm just going to go ahead and play this. And um, now we didn't have the black box data, so we just played this in slow motion. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and um, so he he spun out and and he went towards the medium and he, he lost control. And we didn't show the other cars because that was in dispute exactly how that happened. But here's what wasn't in dispute the cables, okay? And the cable design and installation was improper. And because it, it didn't it didn't have the pull force, yeah, and you see that post there, it didn't have the pull force that it was designed to have, okay, that it should have had. And so we've got marks in there. And so our, our job was to show exactly how this failed. And so we can even show, okay, so you see the bumper damage there. And we show, okay, that's where it came impact, it impacted the post, okay? And we show that the, the animation is accurate. And then it's the post slid across the top of the Dodge Viper. What we show our 3D model is exactly the same as the inspection photo that you previously saw. Unfortunately, what happened was that cable sliced the man's head off. And we had to we had to do a sensor there, but because it was a uh, a convertible, okay, and because that post came up, it shouldn't have come up, but because that post came up, um, that cable went up and over the top of of the glass and then sliced his head. But we were able to show that with great detail without getting too gory into the details, but show it from an engineering perspective. So that's what we, that's, that's the kind of thing we do. That's awesome, Cody. I'll give you a little plug. I've not used you, but what you, that is very awesome what you just demonstrated. And I like using tests, but a lot of times I can't do a test. That would be hard to recreate that. I mean, I guess you can try to try to make that happen and have a car go off road and crash and the odds of it being exactly right are, are, are slim to none. So a lot of times I will use animations like that. And that was, you know, because that's how you can prove it when you can't do a test. Sometimes I like to use both anyway, because anyway, great job. That's interesting stuff. Well, thanks, Brandon. I'd love to geek <clears throat> out with your, with your engineers and your expert witnesses. And, and I just love that stuff. And I love communicating it to normal people that just um, can can watch it and understand. Yeah, no, I see your energy in that. So yeah, I'm, I'm, we're going to work together. That sounds great. Yeah. <clears throat> That's it. And I tell you, I, I always say this. I love your enthusiasm and your passion for the work that you do. Mm -hmm. And it shows, Cody. So thank you for everything. And uh, be sure to put your information in the chat box. Everybody <clears throat> can stay in touch. And I look forward to seeing you again on our webinar next Thursday on cross-examination. So, sounds great. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Ginger. Yep, thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you. All right, Brian, I do have a question that came through okay. um, from Gregory. Would you like to take that one now? Sure. So he says, when reviewing a police report to assess whether evidence supports an auto defect case in terms of their description of the crash, pathway of the cars, the diagram of the scene and the pathway for the vehicle, do you have any recommendations or best practices on how to assess whether or not the investigating officer is qualified in the accident reconstruction and or if you know is conducted in a competent investigation and reached the correct conclusions? Yeah, that is a great question because I don't want I don't know if I could say nine times out of 10, but oftentimes, you know, the police aren't generally qualified. To, to reconstruct these cases to the extent we do in an auto defect case. So wonderful question. Usually what they'll do is they'll show up on the scene, they'll see a car rolled over. Uh, let's say it's a rollover case. They'll sit there and do some squiggly lines on the police report indicating, well, it rolled over here. And they might say three times. They don't know if it rolled over once, twice, three times, four times. So oftentimes they're not qualified. Um, I, I mainly will use the police report 
One is, is I really like to get the scene photos so I can kind of start reconstructing things myself. And I want to find out about drugs and alcohol and things like that. When I get to my seatbelt buckle section, you'll see the police can say your client's not belted when they were, just the belt, the belt had a defect. Um, so, but how do I give more weight to, to a report versus another? So for example, in California, we've got, you know, mate, a mate team will come out there uh, if, there's a, if there's a lot of deaths. Um, I forget what it stands for, multidisciplinary, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if they have them in every state. But when I'm looking at a, at a police report, if I see the police is out there spray painting, you know, red marks in the road, taking measurements and really trying to reconstruct it, they may be more right than wrong. But if I see a report that's got a lot of math in it and a lot of measurements, at least I know they're trying to do a decent job. And there'll be some useful information that's going to usually be pretty OK. If I don't see measurements or anything like that, and I just see a conclusion that car was going, you know, based on witness, witness one, witness two, and witness three, so-and-so was going 75 miles an hour and they rolled over, that's not really a lot of useful information. So um, I guess the more detail, the better with regard to a team out there taking measurements and documenting, it would give me a lot more security that there's uh, going to be some, some validity to what they're concluding. I hope that answered the question. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian. And um, now I know we've got a lot of other great information to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to you. We can pull up where we left off. Okay. And, um, appreciate this. All righty. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, tire cases or tread separation cases. And um, it's really all you, all I look for at intake is did a tread, so let's look at the picture here on the right. There you can see the tread is missing off the tire. You see that? Here's the sidewall. There's just no tread. When I see a tire, and this oftentimes, almost always, will lead to a rollover. <clears throat> For whatever reason, it seems to be a rear tire on an SUV, a van, or a truck. And if it's the left rear, it's going to pull the car to the left. And then from watching my rollover presentation, now you know what's going to happen. The driver's going to turn the car to the right, and it's going to roll over. Or if it's a right rear tire, the friction's different when the tread misses, it pulls the car to the right, driver's gonna turn it to the left and they're gonna roll over. So tread cases typically will end up being a rollover case and a roof crush case as well. But at intake, what do I look for? Just missing tread. Here's another tire, it's harder to see, but you can just see there's the tread is missing all the way around that tire. So at intake, when I see that, I'm thinking, okay, potential tread separation case, that should not happen. You're going to want to preserve the tread. I have a picture of it there. Usually the police will throw it in the back of the trunk of the car, uh, back of the SUV, um, and you'll have it. Now, <clears throat> the reason I have to have an expert look at this is there, there are certain defenses on these cases that I can't tell with my naked eye um, if I have a good tread separation case or not. I just know if tread's missing, I have a case. This I'll send it to the expert because things that they're going to look for that can harm the case is... Was there a bad patch on the case? So if you if it say the person had a flat six weeks before, six months before, two years before, if you get a bad patch, you can get air, moisture, water in that patch. And then that starts loosening up the steel belts. That's a defense to a tread separation case, or it can be a defense. So I'm going to want to look for, was it patched and was it patched badly? Now, if Pep Boys or Kmart or whoever patched it poorly, now you have another defendant and you're just going to you know, sue them for negligence for, for a bad patch job, perhaps. But that might not be uh, necessarily a good tread separation case. The other thing the experts look for, which don't rule out a case like a bad patch would, but goes against the client, is they'll argue that there's evidence the, the tire was underinflated and the person was driving it with you know 10 pound, too little PSI in it, underinflated tires. Treads can't separate. I still take those cases, but it's not as good of a case. So the expert really will, you know, dig into the carcass of the tire to find out, to look for things like underinflation, patches, uh, curb damage. Maybe the car hit a curb uh, somewhere in its lifetime, and they'll be able to see damage to the tire inside the tire um, and, and things like that that will identify if you have a great tire case, a so-so tire case, or a very poor tire case. Um, <clears throat> The other thing I like to do then is if I send that tire uh, to the expert and they tend to like the case, 
I'll send them the other three tires because experts can do, it's called shareography and they'll x-ray the tires. And what you'll see, if you've got a match set of four tires, you know, not a, not four different used tires, different manufacturers, it wouldn't work. But if you've got, like a lot of us, you've got four tires, you put a spare on one um, or in, in the tread separated, they can x-ray the other three tires. And more often than not, or often enough, they will be evidence of a tread separation waiting to happen even in those other tires. That helps you on your defect part of the case. If they wanna blame the tread separating tire for being underinflated, a curved strike, a bad patch, those are things they may wanna argue, but then how come the other three tires are showing evidence on x-ray that the treads are coming apart, the steel belts are getting loose. Um, so again, at intake, I just look for a missing tread. And unfortunately on these, you really do have to have an expert look at it uh, to find out the strengths and weaknesses of it. So this is one area where I've been doing this you know, for a long time, but I, I can't tell by looking at a tire uh, what the defenses may be. But at intake, catastrophic injury, missing tread, get an expert on that one. Uh, oh, there's another example. You can see right there, the tread's gone. So when the expert has the case, they'll go through this thing. They'll look at it, they'll x-ray it, they'll look at it. They'll, they'll pick out things up here where they can tell steel belts were missing. There might be a bad, a bad splice. There's a lot of things that go on inside a tire that the experts can identify um, what the alternative designs are um, that could have prevented the tread from separating. So that's really it on, on tires. Missing tread and you have to get an expert on it. I wish I could, could be a little more specific on that one, but that's just it for tires. But it happens a lot, so we have to be aware of those cases. Now, airbags. A few different defects we have here. This is an example of failure to deploy. You look, you know, if I get an intake and I see a car that's been in a crash like that, I mean, that's a big crash. And I see the airbag didn't deploy, and I've got a, someone with a catastrophic brain injury, um, or, or whatever injury from, you can see how deformed this steering wheel is. You know, I know I have an airbag case. You know, I don't need an expert to tell me that airbag should have deployed. Now, one thing to be careful for, because I made this mistake, you know, 25 years ago and learned the hard way a couple of times, is if it's an old car, this looks like a pretty old car here. Sometimes car will be in a crash, someone will junk it, some sleazy used car dealer will repair it and sell the car and there'll be no airbag in it. So I'm looking at this going, man, that airbag should have deployed. But when I see an, an older car, it won't be happening on a new car. But if I see an older car with that damage and no airbag, I'm going to have my expert go peel back that cover and confirm that there is an airbag in there that failed to deploy. Now, obviously, if there's no airbag in there, then you've got some other defendants to start potentially looking at who, who, uh, who salvaged the car, who, who repaired it, who sold it. Unfortunately, oftentimes fly-by-night companies with no insurance, but not necessarily. Um, I ha I've had a rental car company do it one time, and I, I think they just bought a car from somebody they didn't know it was missing an airbag. But in general, big property damage, no airbag, you probably have an airbag case. I don't need an expert to look at this, do a download, and figure out what the Delta V was in, in the various stages of deployment of the airbag. Now, <clears throat> The other thing that we'll see from time to time, it's called inadvertent deployment. And here's a car, uh, not in an accident. You know, there's no damage to the front. Again, I need some better examples. It's an older car, but no damage to the car at all. It was sitting at a, uh, at a red light and both airbags just deployed. It happens sometimes, or you can be driving down the road, airbags will deploy and someone will get in a crash and it's called inadvertent deployment. Um, that's not, so if they're parked, obviously that's not supposed to happen. If it happens when they're driving down the road, I will get an expert involved because one of the defenses, which I don't think is a good defense, but they will argue if you're driving, maybe uh, a rock that was in the road bounced up and hit the bottom of the car where the sensor was and caused the airbag to deploy. Now, I don't mind that because you could design cars and place sensors in better locations to where that doesn't happen. But if a car hat was not in an accident and the airbag deploys, it's called inadvertent deployment. Uh, I'm going to want to get an expert involved in that and do a download and, and try to figure out why they why the airbags deployed. But those are going to be good cases. <clears throat> now, here's the gray zone. And I get, if not weekly, certainly biweekly, people referring me a case to look at 
and say, hey, you know, the airbag didn't deploy. And, and, and you know, look, look at this car. It's got damage. It's got damage there. It's missing the grill. It's kind of the hood is buckled and the fender's buckled right there. So, you know, it was in a front end, front end collision, but the airbag didn't deploy. And normally when you have damage like that or a little bit worse, people will, will rightfully probably assume, hey, the airbag should have deployed. Um, now, a couple of problems. Usually the person's not that hurt in this crash, so you're not going to have the damages. But even if they were, you know, the airbag, there's something called the gray zone. You can't make an airbag deploy at, let's say, uh, you have a Delta V, 12 miles an hour or below doesn't deploy, 12.1 mile an hour above it does. It's just you can't make it that exact. So there's this gray zone. Airbags typically will be, you know, a 15 mile an hour Delta V or 16, 17 mile an hour Delta V and above must deploy below 12 mile an hour Delta V must not deploy. Then you got that five mile an hour range because you just can't make it that precise. So this is an example of the gray zone and the airbag just wasn't supposed to deploy. So if you have front end damage that doesn't look really significant, you're probably in the gray zone. A download will let you know that. Um, but it's something to keep an eye on. I've, I've had you know, a lot of people that don't do auto defect cases always assume that these are good airbag cases. And, you know, airbags are really dangerous. I mean, they could, they could really harm you. And so, you know, you only want to deploy an airbag in a crash to where you're better off risking getting some injury from the airbag hitting in the face or in the side of the head than you hitting the hard steering wheel and getting a TBI or something. So you don't want airbags deploying in minor crashes. Um, so that's that's where you end up getting that gray zone. So again, it didn't take big damage, no airbag. I know that's probably a case unless it's missing the airbag. No damage airbag deploys. That's an inadvertent deployment. That's going to be a great case because that's just not supposed to happen. Um, and then you're going to have these gray zones. And if you're just not sure, um, you just have to get a download and then uh, find out what the Delta V is. And if I see it above, oh, 14, 15, 16, then I know, man, that airbag probably should have deployed. I may still have an expert look at it, but when I see it down in very low teens or less, I know we're probably in the gray zone. Now, oh, another area on airbags, and this, this doesn't happen a lot, but it happens enough. I see these every year. And as I said, airbags are dangerous, um, but you're not supposed to get these types of injuries from it. So this is what I call either a late deployment or an aggressive deployment. If you've got a client that's got significant facial fractures or if they lose an eye, um, sometimes they can break your neck and get paralyzed. You know, if you've got injuries like that, I'm going to want to look towards either a late deployment, meaning I've had clients, you get in an accident, they go forward, airbag doesn't deploy. It's supposed to time just right. I've had clients go forward and as their head is down, the airbag deploys late and, and slams their head down and they break their neck. And again, we're just talking milliseconds. You know, when I say late, it's, it, it's, it's like that late. But uh, you get these kinds of injuries. You, you want to look for a late deployment or an aggressive deployment. Airbags deploy in stages. And an expert can look at the download and figure out what the parameters were. Was it a, you know, a, a one stage or a dual stage deployment? Was the timing off on it? Um, again, this is going to be one of those areas that at intake, I see injuries like this and an airbag deployed. I know that that shouldn't happen, but I will have I will you know have an expert go download the the uh, download the EDR and figure out you know was it aggressive was it late and then sometimes maybe have to do some discovery against the manufacturer. So harder to identify up front, but you're not supposed to get injuries like this from an airbag. You will get. You know, can you get burns? People will get like a, a bad, you know, burn on their arms or their hands, you know, uh, you know, bad like, you know, rug burn or something like that. Yes. Um, you know, maybe a chip tooth. You know, it's not nice, but again, it can happen. But if you have significant facial fractures, blindness, I have, I've had a lot of clients that were blinded from an airbag. Not supposed to happen. They time it to where that's not supposed to happen. Okay, seatbelt failures. Now, seatbelts fail in a, in a number of ways. How are we doing on time? I'm going to have to speed up here. Um, this is called false latch. I'm going to, this is, this car is driving into a barrier right here. Or this test, I'm going to freeze frame it. 
Okay, so you see this dummy right here is belted. You see this, this shoulder belt right there. You see the lap belt right there. This is a crash test. So they're crashing it into the wall, and you're going to watch that seatbelt come undone. See? I'm not going to run it again because I want to finish these slides, and, and I know I'm, I'm getting short on time here. But um, that's called false latch. Someone thinks they're buckled up. Now, if, if this was an auto accident, someone asked a question earlier, how do you know if the police are right or wrong? Well, this policeman, if that was a real accident, that was your client, and, and they were killed or catastrophically injured, the officer would say they weren't wearing their seatbelt. And obviously they, they were. So, you know, when a client swears or people in the car swear they were wearing the belt, I know it's easy to do what we do for a living. And, you know, they have people lie to us from time to time and not want to believe them. But when it comes to seatbelt usage, you know, seatbelt buckles fail. And, and so you do want to take it very seriously and look for a defect. This one's called false latching, meaning the, the tongue is into the buckle. It doesn't click, but the buckle sticks in there. So you think you're you're buckled up and it's called false latching. Um, inadvertent unlatch. This is, I'm hey, gonna Brian, write this. I was yeah. just gonna tell you, um, take the time that you need because we still have like about 30 minutes or so. So oh, you okay. plenty of time. Okay. If we go over, that's fine too. Okay? okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, this is so interesting though. Like I'm, it's just fascinating. I'm learning so much about it and I um, oh, can't wait to see what's up coming up next. So thank you. Okay, well, that, thank you, Ginger. I appreciate that. Um, so another defect, folks, that, that we see a lot, it's called inadvertent unlatch. And on the left, it's just a silly example where I have um, this surrogate, her hands on the steering wheel. You see she's wearing her seatbelt. She's going to turn the steering wheel to the right, and her elbow is going to unbuckle the, uh, the seatbelt. <clears throat> and this happens in rollovers. People's elbows can hit it, see? That's not supposed to happen. Buckles are designed to where your elbow's not supposed to be able to uh, unlatch it. Next time, I'm not going to use someone as thin as her because it probably looks like I'm trying to trick the test uh, with a with a skinny elbow or something. But that's not supposed to happen. Um, buckles are designed to where your elbow cannot get in there and open it up, or your palm if you're in a rollover and your hands are flying around. You need your seatbelt buckle to stay latched. So when a buckle comes undone, it's called inadvertent unlatch. That's an example of it. Now, to show that it happens in the real world, here's a crash test. This car is going into a barrier like that crash test I showed you a moment ago. You see the dummy here is wearing its seatbelt. What happens is this dummy, after it hits the wall, the dummy's elbow, it goes, you know, he kind of goes forward, he or she. Uh, then when it's going back, the dummy's elbow pops the seatbelt buckle. Now you can't see it, but you see the seatbelt buckle come undone. And in the crash test report, the test engineers documented that this was an inadvertent unlatch. So you see he's buckled right now. Now the dummy's elbow is going back there unlatching it. And you see it's loose now. And then you'll see the little chrome tongue, shiny tongue right there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's an example of like the one of the surrogate study I did on the left hand side of the screen of, of the girl's elbow hitting it and coming undone. Here's a real crash test where that dummy's elbow popped the buckle open. And again, if police were investigating that accident, they'd say your client wasn't wearing their seatbelt. Um, and they were. And so what do you look for at intake on this? Um, well, let me back up. So <clears throat> this on that inadvertent unlatch, here's an example. See, here's a, this is a 40 millimeter ball. They rub, the auto industry will get a ball on a stick and they rub it over the top of a, a buckled seatbelt. And it's not supposed to be able to open. There are a lot of Takata ABO buckles on the road, millions of them, that with a 40 millimeter ball, you can see you can't unlatch it. See the ball's touching there, touching there. The orange button is there. Well, it was supposed to pass a 30 millimeter ball test, meaning the ball was smaller and the buckles all fail that test. So rather than redesign the buckle with a bigger overhang here or making that, that button flush, they just made the ball bigger to pass the test. They're great cases. Um, again, it's a Takata ABO buckle. Uh, rather than, than fix the product, they just changed the test. Um, so what do you look for at intake? Here's what I do. Um, <clears throat> if the car's local, I'll go look at it myself, or sometimes I'll have an investigator that's cheaper than an expert go out on Zoom. You know, we learn from the pandemic how to use Zoom now all the time. I'll have them FaceTime or Zoom and hold the iPad 
um, up next to the seatbelt buckle so I can look uh, for what I'm gonna, here's called load marks and I have a few other pictures, but now you see these little striations right here with these yellow arrows. It's like this little rub mark there. Okay, that that's his seatbelt webbing going through there really fast and melting that plastic. Okay, right here, you can see it up there in the corner. Okay. Now, if this person's ejected out of the car, we know they are wearing their seatbelt because you can't get this from wear and tear. These are examples of these people were wearing their seatbelt, even though they were killed in a crash because they got ejected from the car. Here's another example of it. It's real faint, but it's not wear and tear. You can't get these kinds of marks in this plastic just from normal usage. The seatbelt webbing, they got in a big crash, went across that plastic, melted it. So if, if you have a client says they were belted or witnesses say they were belted and maybe they were killed so they can't tell you, go look at the seatbelts. And if you see marks like that, they were wearing their seatbelt. Um, another example of the load marks. Um, another example, another thing to look for, I had a, a guy in a rollover down in Mexico, got ejected out the back and killed. Police said he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. And the seatbelt, this is this black thing, it's the D-ring. You know where you pull your seatbelt out of your B-pillar right here to buckle up? That's called a D-ring up there. If you see seatbelt webbing twisted through there and bunched up, they call that bunching. You know that that person was wearing their seatbelt. And again, this was a guy in a rollover, got spit out of the car, killed. Everybody said he wasn't wearing his seatbelt. And I went to go look at the car because it was about 20 minutes from my office. And uh, I saw that bunching. I knew he had to be wearing it. And one of these pictures, it was also his latch plate with the load marks. So I knew right out of the gate, I, had, I didn't need an expert to go look at that for me. I knew this person was belted and the buckle either inadvertently unlatched, it was false latched. Um, but it was it was latched for a while before he got ejected. Another thing to look for is this is the uh, left rear seat behind the driver. There's where the, the D-ring comes out. Here was a kid, got in a rollover, got ejected out of that window um, and paralyzed. Now, there wasn't a lot of load marks on the seat belt for us to confirm it. Because if you unlatch it too soon with that elbow, you might not get those witness marks that I was showing earlier, those load marks. But what we did find is, is when someone is wearing a seatbelt, if they get ejected out of a car and it comes undone, the seatbelt will go and it'll get entangled in their arm. And you'll usually take the seatbelt out the window with you on whatever side you're on. So what we noticed is right here where he would be seated, and this is the window he went out. If you hold the seatbelt up next to that rubber, that's what we have right here. And it was the same width as the seat belt. And that looks like that webbing left a mark of that, that person going out the window. So that's how we were able to prove he got entangled in his seat belt. He had to have been wearing it because you couldn't get those marks. Okay, so that's it on seat belts. Um, door latch, I see a lot of these cases and doors should stay open in crashes. You know, I'm probably older than a lot of people on this uh, webinar, but when I was a little kid, the seat uh, doors rather, when you opened them, you had a push button with your thumb. You'd push, have to push the button in and then you'd open the door. Well, what they learned back in the 60s and 70s is cars were rolling over, that button would push and pop the door open. So that's why we now have to pull a door out towards us. You know, they, 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 they're the opposite of what they used to be. So if you roll over, you're, you're not unlatching the door. So, but door latches fail all the time and absolutely unnecessary. So if you get it, if you get a rollover accident, a T-bone accident, any kind of accident, and someone gets seriously injured because the door opens up, you want to investigate a door latch case. So at intake, if I see a door that's open, or maybe it'll still shut after a crash, but it's referenced in the police report that it, it was open, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start looking for door latch. Um, here's an example. Uh, in this case, I had a, a, a mom in the back seat rushing their child to the hospital who uh, was like 18 months old and high fever. They were worried the child was going to die. They get T-boned in an intersection. This door pops open um, and mom and the child get, get spit out of the car and seriously, well, luckily the child didn't, but the mom got seriously injured. Now, you might think it got hit right there on the door handle. That's a pretty big crash. You know, how do you prevent that? Well, you can. I don't know if I have a diagram in here. I don't. 
So what happens is inside doors, a, an improperly designed door, and this was one of them, they have a metal rod that goes from the handle to the latch. Well, when you have a metal rod inside this door skin and the door gets hit, that metal rod will bend when the car's hitting it or a signpost is hitting it or an animal is hitting it, whatever the case may be, and that metal rod will pop open the door. Properly designed doors have a cable system in there. So there's some give and take. So, you know, your door will open it when you want to, but when it gets hit, it's designed to flex inside the door and not pop open. Very easy to figure out. Um, doors should not pop open. So I, I know nine times out of 10, if I've got a crash and a door opened up, I know it's got a metal rod inside of it. It just does because otherwise it shouldn't happen. Here's a test just to give you an example. So what we're gonna do, here's a test we ran. This is just gonna push on the door right here. And you're gonna watch the door, it just pops it open because there's a metal rod in there. And you can just imagine all the various accident scenarios that can happen. That could happen in a rollover um, where the, the road just hits the door and pops it open like that. You could get T-boned uh, in an intersection. The door can pop open like that. You could just be involved in a, in a, you know, a single vehicle accident and hit a signpost um, or a tree and the door can pop open. Anything that impacts the side of the door with these metal rods in them. And there are other defects as well, but that's a very common one. The doors will just pop open. So if I see a crash and a door popped open, nine times out of 10, I know it's going to be a really good case because doors should not pop open. So that's it on the doors, fires, <coughs> excuse me. These you need to get experts involved in too, but this general rule of thumb is when you look at the vehicle, if the occupant looks, if it looks like the kind of crash they shouldn't have died in, that maybe they'd be hurt, maybe they shouldn't have been hurt, but they should not die in a subsequent fire. Cars don't have to catch on fire. So if I don't show you some photos, if I get an intake, I know someone burned to death or got serious burns and I'm looking at the car going, well, you shouldn't have died in that crash. Well, then the rule of thumb is if you shouldn't die in it, there certainly shouldn't be a fire that kills you. So here's a couple of examples. So at intake, here's a you know car. I mean, they, the car mounted this center divider and then there was a pole on it that ran over and the pole, you can see where it broke the bumper or bent the bumper back there, but not a bad crash at all. Nobody should have got even hurt in this accident, but that pole ran under the car and just sliced open the gas tank. And then this poor person that was in the right front seat, like 70 degree burns over her body and 60 days later, uh, you know, died from them. Very easy fix. You could have, you know, you could shield the gas tank differently. You can have an inner line inside, inner liner inside of it. This is not supposed to happen. I look at this picture of intake going, you don't get hurt in that. You don't even get hurt in that crash, let alone die. There's gotta be a defect. And then on this one, it was a lack of an inner liner. Here, this case, just poor design gas tank behind the rear axle instead of in front of the rear axle, like the old four Pinto days. Now, this is a bigger crash than the one I just showed a moment ago, but the driver here rear-ended the car, opened his door and walked away. It's not a crash you get hurt in. You know, I mean, you might, you might want a physical therapy or something, but you certainly don't die in this crash. Well, in this front vehicle, in light of what we've talked about earlier, the very first defect on seat backs, remember seats get rear-ended and seats go back. What happened here is there were two people in the front in this rear end crash, the seats laid down. So they're now stuck on their back, kind of got their bell rung on top of having a fire. So they weren't able to get out of the car. And the witnesses heard the two people inside this vehicle, you know, screaming until they succumbed to the to death from the, from the fire. So I see a rear ender like this. I'm thinking seat back case. I'm obviously thinking fire case. And on the fire case, so you, you'll need to get an expert to look at that, to look at, you know, where was the tank placed? How was it punctured? Um, you know, was it preventable? But again, generally they are. If you shouldn't die in the crash, you can prevent that tank from rupturing. And sometimes it's as simple as this. Here's a case I had. You can see the, that's the fuel filler neck down there. It used to be up here where you put the gas in. And then we had a tread separation. It ripped that down there. And then this car caught on fire. A lot of times these fuel filler necks will pull out of the gas tank. And then as soon as they do that, um, any type of spark 
will ignite that fuel and you're going to have a big fire. Here's a very easy fix for five bucks and a lot of cars don't have this. It's called a fuel check valve. You'll see this gas come pouring out. Oh, it's, it's water, not gas. And that's what happened in that van. This, this happened, the, the, the steel belts from the tires started sparking, the van blew up and burned everybody in it. Now, for less than five bucks, this has got a, a check valve inside that tank spud right there. Not even a drop comes out. So a lot of times in a fire case, one of the things I look for is, you know, it could be gas tank placement. Is it behind the rear axle? Is it around unfriendly surfaces that when the car gets rear-ended, uh, you can get a fire? But uh, also, these cases I like the best is if you find out that the, whether you put the gas in, goes down that fuel, uh, uh, goes down the fuel filler neck, it plugs into the gas tank down here. If that was disconnected in the crash and had a fire, oftentimes it's because they don't have that little $5 part to prevent that from happening. So again, at intake, you know, does it look like you should survive the crash? I'm going to investigate the fire case. And then if I want to get into the weeds a little bit further, in addition to what punctured the gas tank, if anything, I want to find out if this fuel filler neck became disengaged from the gas tank. And then you've got this real easy fix. Okay, I think this is the last one. Um, and... There's a lot of these cases out there right now, and it's lack of including safety options. Uh, so, for example, here's a case. This guy got T-boned. Looks like a really bad T-bone, but if you look at it, it's really up more by the feet, back here where the, the driver's seat is. There's not a lot of intrusion. This guy got a catastrophic brain injury. And so at intake, I'm thinking, okay, so he's got a head injury. Something hit his head. He got T-boned. I immediately go look for an airbag, and I see no airbag up here. And then I'll go online and I'll Google the year make and model car. Nine times out of 10, I'll find out that a safety option is it comes with a side curtain airbag. If it did, my client doesn't have that injury. I want to confirm that with a biomechanic, but you will see. So, I mean, the auto industry, again, if seatbelts weren't required, if front airbags weren't required, they just want to charge you extra for it. Um, and most people don't know it. I've, I've got an old email, I won't name the manufacturer because it's confidential, but they made a half a billion dollars more profit selling cars without safety options. Now that seems kind of counterintuitive. You think more expensive the car, you're gonna make more profit. But the average person, when they go buy a car, they don't all say, hey, I want this safety device, I want that safety device. I remember when I was a little kid and I went to go buy a Honda, and a little Honda Civic, I was in college, and the guy said, how much do you want to spend a month? And I said, 180 bucks. Well, they're going to put me in the cheapest car that they make the most profit on that'll have no safety options on it. And they make their money. And that's how they end up making more money without selling safety options, even though, again, it's kind of counterintuitive. Most people go to the car lot and they say they want to spend X, X dollars a month. You never want to answer that question when you're buying a car because that's what they're going to do. They're going to fit your budget and give you the cheap piece of crap on the lot. So at intake, head injury, no airbag, I'm thinking, okay, did it come as a safety option item? If it did, good case. Um, and even if it wasn't an option item, they, if as long as the technology was around and it has been since like the late 90s, they should have that. Um, just another example, side curtain. Um, now, sometimes there's two different kinds of airbags. There's this, there's this side airbag that you get T-boned and it comes down. Now that won't necessarily activate in a rollover because it's a side airbag, but then you have rollover airbags that are made to activate in a rollover. So sometimes in rollovers, a person's head during the rollover will go outside the window plane, hit the ground, you'll get a TBI or kill. Well, if they needed to have a rollover airbag in there. So I'm looking for that. At intake, if I see a car that rolled over, some roof crushing, no side airbag, I'm thinking rollover airbag. They've had those since 2002 and a half. This is some new technology that I just learned about a couple of years ago, but it's been around for about five, six, seven years. It's these center airbags. Back in the old days, I would get cases where people in the back or the front, they would conk heads and get killed or get a catastrophic injury and there was no way to prevent it. I mean, other than put somebody in a five point racing harness and no one's gonna wear that seatbelt to keep you rigidly in your seat like in a race car. Well, this technology of these center 
airbags. They have them in the front. Um, there's a crash test into a big old pole. Um, you can see how it keeps, you know, this dummy's got the side airbag there. This dummy's got that airbag there. Um, they took out the picture, but we also have it. They have it in rear seats too. I've had a lot of sad cases with children in the rear that they get T-boned and they hit heads. And they've got these airbags now that come up in the center that stop that head-to-head -head contact. So not too many cars have these on the road. So if you have somebody in a vehicle at intake and, and you know that they had, you know, catastrophic head injury or, or a fatal head injury, even if it's not head-to-head, -head, head into the other person's body somehow, these airbags are a great safety option item. So a lot of the failure to equip safety option cases are, you know, side airbag, rollover airbag, these center airbags. Um, it's good technology and manufacturers until the government makes them do it. They're not going to do it. So I think that's it. Um, sorry, I went a little bit over. Um, hopefully that was informative and hopefully I didn't rush too much at the end and it made sense. But again, here's my phone number and email. If anybody's got any questions, wants a copy of this PowerPoint, wants free copies of the two books I wrote on this, I'm happy to you know, sharing is caring. I'll share with you everything I've got because that's how I ended up getting where I am as I stole all this stuff from other people. So it's my turn to give back. No, you did a fabulous job, Brian. And I cannot thank you enough for all of your time today. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I, I didn't want you to stop. I wanted you to keep going because there's so much valuable information here. And, um, but before we let everybody go, we've got a couple announcements and, um, I want to introduce Blue with HMR, who's going to share with you guys all the great things that they do over there. Um, Blue is also going to be coming, hopefully, to our Nashville TBI seminar, which is going to be May 6th through the 9th. Um, and we have so many incredible surprises that we are doing next year, you guys. I am really excited. I can't wait to start announcing them soon. But um, Blue, thank you for all the incredible support that you guys do over, the, over there at HMR. Um, if you could tell us a little bit more about what you guys do. Absolutely. Thanks, Ginger. And thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. What a great presentation, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, so uh, HMR Servicing, uh, we're a nationwide uh, you know, funding company. I, I would venture to say that we are the premier funding source for personal injury uh, plaintiff law firms. Um, I want to highlight three things with everyone today um, that Three the, the three main things that we offer, the first of which would be pre-settlement funding. Um, we understand that this is a tough time for your client. Uh, maybe they can't pay their, their mortgage or their rent or, you know, they're having uh, vehicle issues. Um, so we can step in and help out, um, on you know, sometimes on those cases for you guys. Uh, we also offer case cost funding um, to help help you shore up your case, you know, if you need experts. You need a life care plan, uh, uh, accident reconstruction specialist, you know, anything like that. Um, we, we, we'd love to help you out with that. Um, third, <clears throat> excuse me, third and final thing uh, would be medical funding. So we are, we are currently in 40 states. Uh, and the reason I like to bring that up um, is to let, you know, attorneys know that we have quite the, quite the network of providers nationwide. Um, that we're able to utilize. Uh, the nice thing about the providers that we use is that they're aware of what, what we're doing here. Uh, they're aware that, you know, this is a personal injury case, um, which means, you know, the reporting uh, needs to needs to reflect that, right? Um, so it, I feel like there's, there's quite a bit of value in just having the right doctors and the right network in order to step in and really help build a case with you guys. Um, so uh, with that, um, I don't want to take up too much more of anyone's time. We did get new hats, Ginger, so I thought I would support that today. Take it for a little test drive. <laughs> Fantastic. Perfect. I think we're going to have to get some as well so we can wear them out. <laughs> totally. Um, I like and I tell you, I just cannot thank you enough for your incredible support. And um, also, I know you're here to announce the winner of the coffee giveaway. And then um, I'm going to go back to that because I see some good questions coming in the um, Q&A box for you, Brian. So uh -oh. I'll loop back in there in just a minute. Um, but Blue, if you could do the honors and let us know who the winner is of the four bags of freshly roasted coffee, that would be great. Absolutely. So the winner of the coffee 
is Alan Dolison uh, out of Los Angeles, California. Congratulations, Alan. Hey, I know nice. Alan. Hey, Alan. You know Alan? Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, congratulations to Alan. Um, and thank you for watching today. Um, both myself and um, Blue and Ted are going to reach out to you um, to make sure that we get you that copy right away. But um, congratulations, Alan. We hope you enjoy it. And for those of you who didn't win, don't worry, because there's one more chance next Thursday before the end of the year where you can get in and win. So we hope that you do. And um, congratulations again, Alan. Thank you, Blue, again, for all that you do. And we hope we see you again very soon as well. And happy holidays. Thank you, Ginger. Thanks, Brian. Have a good Thanks. one. Have a great afternoon, man. Thanks. And then don't forget to drop your information in the chat box. Okay, Blue? Absolutely. All right. See you soon. And then um, now, Brian, uh, I got this one, one more question. It's a really good one from Gregory, um, who also is a great attorney out of Texas. Um, he came to our Savannah seminar recently after watching these webinars. So I was excited to meet him. But he says, um, for cases where there is a product liability statute law requiring a plaintiff to identify a reasonable, safer, alternative design that prevents or greatly reduces the risk of energy, of injury, do you use a particular type of expert to explain how the alternative design product would have done so such as a biomechanical engineer, or do you use like a combination of experts in these fields to meet this requirement? Yeah, usually there'll be two. So, for example, if it's a if it's a seat back case where the seat collapses, um, and you and there are plenty of alternative feasible designs out there, I'll have my seat expert talk about the alternative feasible design and how it's a safer design. And they can talk about it from the engineering standpoint on test dummies that where these dummies are instrumented so that the head's instrumented, the necks are instrumented, et cetera. And then hand in hand with the biomechanic, talk about it from the biomechanical perspective that the injury would not have happened. So seat case, I'll use a bio and a seat expert. If it's a roof crush case, I'll have a roof structures expert talk about the alternative design roof, 40 box stronger roof, but we'll still need the biomechanic to say that that would have prevented the injury because the defense is not going to ever concede that a strong roof and you would have had a different outcome. They argue you dive into the roof. And so you're going to have to have a biomechanic, uh, you know, talk about the, the diving defense in a roof crush case. So yeah, generally two experts, the defect related expert with the alt design and then tie it in with the biomechanic. Good question. Fantastic. And then Alan's brought in a good question for you now too. He says, state court versus federal court, which do you prefer? Oh, that's easy. State court, run from federal court. I don't care what kind of case it is. Uh, maybe there's an exception to the rule, but for a whole host of reasons, you know, federal court, limited voir dire, sometimes no voir dire, unanimous jury verdict. I mean, you got everything going against you just procedurally on, on your ability to voir dire the jury and bond with them and ask the questions you want. You need a unanimous verdict. You've got Daubert, higher standard for the alternative design. You know, a lot easier for a federal judge to say that's junk science. I'm not gonna let you put on your case. So I run from federal court. Um, I've only tried two of these in federal court and you know it was a nightmare, but I got brought in late and, and, and the attorneys didn't keep it out of federal court. You know, you want to defeat diversity, you know, sue a bullet car driver or another responsible party along with the manufacturer, sue the dealership. Dealership can help defeat diversity, but you need to defeat diversity and stay out of federal court at all costs. And, and then lastly, and this is just a practical one, when it comes to, um, you know, most cases settle, right? And um, I mean, we have fun trying cases, but most cases do settle. The problem with federal court Forgetting all the other reasons I just said, it, it, it's kind of anti-settlement on these cases too, because you have to do your federal reports up front. So you got to front load all this expert witness work months and months and months, oftentimes before trial. So as soon as you have a half a million bucks tied up in a case, it makes it hard to settle that case. You know, you certainly can't settle for a million dollars. Now, if it's $10 million, then the half a million doesn't matter but not every case is a $10 million case. So the problem with federal court, you upload, you front load all that expert work and now your case starts becoming settlement proof or you have a real unhappy client because they're not going to net any money. 
they're going to say, man, the attorney gets all this fee, the experts made all this money, and I'm getting a couple hundred grand. In state court, or most state courts, not all, certainly in California, I have, there are a lot of state courts I've practiced in where they kind of follow the federal rules. But, you know, in California anyway, I don't, I don't throw in that half a million bucks until 30, 45 days before trial. So most of these cases settle. I settle them sometimes without having a nickel in it, or certainly oftentimes less than 10 grand. So that's another reason to, to run from federal court. Good question. Yeah. From my friend Alan. Thanks, Alan, for the softball. <laughs> Well, I cannot thank you guys enough. Um, I am going to make sure that you get a copy of um, Brian's contact information as well as all of our partners today. But like Brian said, reach out to him. Um, his email is bchase. And is it biznarchase.com? Yes. Is that right? Yes. yes. Perfect. Um, and Brian would be happy to send you guys a copy of his slides today. Um, any other questions he'd be happy to address as well as sending you guys a complimentary um, copy of his book that he wrote, which I highly suggest take him up on this offer. And then you can read it throughout the holidays. Um, this is so nice of you, Brian, to offer that to everybody. And again, big thanks to our incredible partners at HMR, On Point Legal Nurse Consulting and Fox AE. Again, you guys know we love working with them and we appreciate the support. So give me a few minutes. I will email this over to you. And then also I'll be adding today's webinar to our Connectionology YouTube channel. So you can rewatch that and share it with your colleagues. Um, until then though, Brian, is there anything else you wanna address with everyone? I just wanna one thank you and all the sponsors for having me on today. Um, it is just an honor and a privilege for me to talk about this. I love that. Um, and if anybody you know, wants to pick my brain on something, I love to, there's people I call all the time and, and pick their brain and, and no use reinventing the wheel. So. Happy to help anybody out. If you have any questions, if you want any other information, that's how we all we all stand on each other's shoulders. So happy holidays to everybody, and thank you for sitting sitting in for the last hour and a half. Oh, absolutely, and thank you for teaching me a lot of new things as well, Brian. Like I said, this was a fascinating presentation, and thank you for all that you do for all of us who are watching today, including all of your clients. So um, happy holidays to you as well, and we hope to have you back very soon. Okay. Look forward to it. Thanks, everybody. All right, everyone. We'll see you next week. Have a great afternoon. Bye.